with me is Mr. I'm going to be looking down a little more than usual because I'm running cameras while I'm doing this. With me is Mr. Thaddeus. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? Good, good, good. Um, so something happened in our game. This is uh, an extra episode that uh, we're doing. Um, it's going to be just me and Thaddeus. There's nobody else around the table with us. It's just the two of us right here. The rest of the players are not going to come for another uh, half hour to hour or whatever. So we have got our own little session that uh, we're doing here because at the end of our last, well, beginning of our last session, somewhere in there, Thaddeus uh, ended up on his own and something happened to him. And the uh, rest of the party doesn't know what that is. So uh, we're going to cover that right now and... Uh, Thaddeus is going to find out what has happened to him. Picking up on where we ended off with Thaddeus, and actually it was the end of two sessions ago, you were um, investigating a shipwreck. Is that right? You were investigating a shipwreck. It was in uh, the lagoon. That is correct. And uh, you guys had arrived in this area from uh, one of the portals that you found. And uh, in investigating uh, the shipwreck, uh, you saw something. You I saw something. I remember very clearly. It looked like um, from the bag, something went past me very, very quickly. And uh, I looked and it appeared to be some sort of fish tail. But at the front that I couldn't quite see, it looked like there was very long flowing hair. Very long flowing hair, that's right. Then what happened? Nothing. Then the game ended. Then the game ended, okay. <laughs> So what happened was, okay, at that moment, you see that long flowing hair go away. All of a sudden, you feel a net wrap around you. And you turn around in the water, struggling to turn around in the water. Right up behind you have come two more of whatever these beings are that uh, you saw swimming away very quickly. Obviously, they're some kind of mermen. They can breathe underwater. They seem to have some kind of short spiky hair, uh, they're clean shaven, uh, they've got some type of leather harness around their chest, there's a trident hanging off of each of their backs attached to this, this harness that's around their chest, there's a long knife hanging down from the side. They have been able to sneak up on you and throw this net over you while you were distracted by whatever was swimming away. As you are trussed up by these two mermen, Whatever it was that was swimming away, you see it circling around and coming back. And it is, uh, in fact, a mermaid. She has got this long, flowing red hair. She's also wearing a leather harness. And she swims right up to you, looks at you, and you just see the most beautiful green eyes. I bow my head respectfully. So you're kicking yourself because obviously this was a distraction to catch you unawares. But at the same time, really, it wouldn't have mattered if you had known they were coming or not. Because obviously they are so much stronger and faster in the water than you are. Of course. That you're not going to be able to avoid them or get away from them the way you might normally if you were on land. There's no nimble dodge for you as a rogue in the water. As this mermaid comes up to you, you, you just struck in utterly dumb by her beauty, this long, dazzling hair, like I said. She swims up, looks you right in the face, and she starts to sing. And as she sings to you, her strange green eyes just draw you in. And there's this enchantment that takes hold, and it just it seems to offer you wonder and happiness and just priceless knowledge. All you need to do is just want it. And you start to feel yourself losing to this siren's call. Roll a fortitude check. No, a will check. It'll be will this time. 12 plus 10. 22. 12 plus 10. 22 is enough. And you find yourself stealing your will, being able to shake it off and bringing yourself back to reality and being able to resist just being enthralled by her. All right? Uh, you see surprise across her face that you've been able to resist her siren's call. And it's like 
surprise first flashes across her face, and then there's some, some anger that her charm has failed, right? And then she's curious, and she takes a closer look, and she examines you, and it's not an unkind look that she's giving you. She seems to be considering something. And finally, she makes some kind of decision, and she actually says something to the other two mer folk that are with her, something in this very high trill. You've never heard this sound before. Uh, but you find that though you, you can't speak it, you can't make the sound, you understand innately what she has said to them. This one is just not the same as the others. He has excellent potential. We must take him to Father, and according to our rights, I do hereby claim him as my own. After another moment of uh, silent inspection, and, and the mermen, they nod as though they expected this, right? So they take you still bound in the net, they finish tying you firmly, and they start swimming back around the, the shipwreck. They come to the back side of the shipwreck, and there's a very, very narrow opening in the back side of the shipwreck. It opens out into a, a, a passage through a long underwater tunnel into this vast subterranean cavern. And uh, it seems to be filled with its own light, some kind of phosphorescent light. As they bring you out from the entrance pool, you find out that they're able to stand, their tails just morph away into legs. And they are standing there looking very much like other regular human beings that you know. You can tell that there's a little bit of difference in them, especially in some of the merfolk features or slightly aquiline features that they have. Uh, they get you on your feet. They make sure that you can walk. And then one of the warriors mutters something in the same merfolk trilling tone. And it sounds different out of the water, but uh, you think the warrior has said something about being on guard as they or something, you, you don't know what the word means, may not all be dealt with. So you look around the cavern, you notice that there's a narrow stream, kind of a couple of them lacing through the cavern. As you're moving along the cavern with them, you notice something on the ground. And this form gets up and you hear this, <laughs> turns to face your little group. It's obviously some kind of of undead because you've dealt with the undead a number of times but in this case it looks to be unlike the undead soldiers you've seen before some type of sailor or pirate or something like that as soon as it begins to move the guards with you and the mermaid with you they spring into action just like that one of the guards leaves you in the charge of the other guard he begins to move forward he pulls the long knife from his belt while he's doing that, all of a sudden you hear the mermaid who's right beside you on the other side. She starts to trill in some unintelligible words that you don't know. She holds up her hand and you see this band of water, narrow band of water just appear from nowhere. And it suddenly sprays out towards this undead pirate thing, lashes him hard in the face and then wraps around his neck and starts to lift him up off the ground. As he's being lifted up by this thing, the merman warrior gets to him and is incredibly fast with his sword. And first there's a leg gone and then there's an arm gone. The mermaid lets go of her spell and this undead corpse drops to the ground, not moving and just laying there. You now circle around this corpse that's there and you move past it. And as you do, you look forward and you see that there are more of them, but there's something very different about these ones. There's three or four of them scattered around the back end of this part of the cavern that you are in. But they are all suspended in these columns of water, and they're spinning around in these columns, unable to get any kind of purchase or anything. These big columns that are probably about four feet round, maybe five feet round, and go up almost to the ceiling. And they just look like one little standing 
whirlpool column by themselves. Right in the midst of all of these columns, you catch sight of this water being of some kind. You guess it must be some kind of water elemental. And it is what is either battling them right now or maintaining them right now or doing something with them. So your entire party passes by this. Apparently it is something that the rest of the party fully expected, leaving it just as it is because they're clearly on a mission to take you somewhere. They get through this cavern with these strange pirate water battle going on, and they bring you to an area. All of a sudden, this part of the cavern starts to narrow and come down to a, a natural archway and opens out into another section. You notice that the streams are no longer shallow. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that there were little swarms of fish in these streams swimming along, and your whole party was very careful to avoid those streams and those fish. There's something about those fish that's, that's not safe. When you get to the point that you see this water elemental beyond that, there are no more fish that you notice visible in the water, and the water goes down a small waterfall uh, from all of these streams and into a much deeper channel. And now there are still pathways, and they lace through the next cavern, but they are up on these ridges. They take you through this to another cavern, and at the end of this one, there's another one of these natural openings. But at this one, there's a small set of very heavily worn steps moving down it. They take you down these steps, and right at the bottom of these steps, all of a sudden the party stops for a moment. The mermaid that's with you she doesn't have weapons attached to her harness like the other. She has a trident, but unlike a long knife belt, she's got a satchel on the side uh, of her belt. She reaches into the satchel, and she brings out this small wiggling thing. She takes this small wiggling thing, she sets it down on the ground, and you realize it's, it's a little baby alligator. And she pets it, and she puts her hand over it, and there's just a slight glow. And then you hear her say something that you guess must be stay in her language. And uh, this little baby alligator just sits there. She then comes back to your party, and the rest of you move around and take another path through the map onto another area. That path winds through the rest of the cavern, until you see up ahead of you a fairly large precipice. You go down these stairs, and then they uh, take you down a secret side passage and down to a platform. On this platform, you see a, a big natural cave opening, and you see what looks to be a party of about seven or eight other merfolk who are standing there, either guarding or waiting, or you don't know what exactly is going on. It looks like there's uh, three females and about four males. Again, the males are in a traditional warrior garb. The females, a couple of them have tridents. One of them does not. Uh, they have these pouches on the side again. There's one of the males who stands out very much as obviously the head or the what I guess you think of as the captain of this group. And as one of the merfolk, he's almost a full head taller than the rest. And unlike the rest of the, rest of the warriors that you've seen, the males that you've seen, he's got a beard. It's all dark hair that he's got. Uh, he's very well muscled. And obviously he is some type of commander or leader or something like that. Leaving you with the guards... The mermaid that has been leading your group walks ahead, walks up to him. You can't hear what they say. They hold a conversation in this high, trilling voice, but it's too far away for you to catch exactly what they're saying. She points back and gestures to you. He looks, nods his head, and turns and starts to walk through the big opening in the cavern. As your guards give you a, a gentle push, not cruel or anything, you've been treated with a lot of respect and lead you towards the this opening of this cavern. The rest of the uh, merfolk stay there as though they're on guard while this big, powerful merfolk captain moves ahead of your group. In this next area, 
it opens into one final cavern, which is quite large. And there are no paths. The entire bottom of the cavern is just a huge subterranean lake. There's a very narrow, uh, almost like a pier, natural pier, jetting out into this lake. And it's got a well-worn path that goes right out. You see this massive bluish-white whale just gently floating in the water, not moving, just apparently waiting. And as you get closer, you realize that it's actually got a harness on it, wrapped around it with what looked like reins running across its back. Now, this whale is massive. It is the size of a ship. These reins that run across the back, this whale is literally looks like a small ship that you're going to board. And without missing a beat, the merfolk captain who's leading your group walks out onto this whale grabs onto the two foremost reins and pulls them up. The whale responds, lifts its head a little bit. The, the two guards and the mermaid that are with you lead you onto this whale. They unwrap you from the net you're in, leaving just your hands bound. And one of them ties one of the reins around your waist. While this is happening, the big merfolk captain of the front, he looks back and he kind of catches your eye. And suddenly, you're shocked for the first time. He actually speaks in Latin to you. And he says, Do not think to escape, human. You are safer with us. Should you find yourself free in the great waters, the Leviathan, or worse, Kraken, will find you and make a meal of you. The captain turns back to the reins, gives them a, a bit of a snap, and this whale begins to move across the top of the lake the other end it begins to submerge and dive down in there are all kinds of bubbles rushing up it dives deeper and deeper as the bubbles rush past you it appears to be going down into some kind of passage it swims down into what is very dark darkness quite deep for a little while and all of a sudden you see that there's some type of faint light ahead of you as the whale with the five of you on its back emerge from this passage you can tell that you're obviously in the open ocean. Because of the current that's being created by the whale moving through the water gently, it's no longer possible to stand on this whale. All of you have been lifted up by the buoyancy of the water, and as you look to the side, to the right, and the left, you can see that the merfolk, who are obviously quite used to this, are now basically just swimming with the whale. Their legs have morphed back into tails. They're each lightly holding their rein, and swimming along with a whale just being towed. For you, it's not quite as clean. You are you are also lifted up, and you're kind of out the back, you know, your legs sticking out the back, and unlike them who are able to use their tails to help, you know, moderate their speed a little bit, stuff like you feel the full force of the water just kind of pushing against you as you're pulled along. But it's not, it's not unbearable, it's just... It's a little bit more than what they've got. So they make sure that they keep you from bouncing around too much in, in the jet stream as this whale moves out into the open ocean. And the ocean is obviously tropical water. It is filled with all kinds of fish. You see giant sea turtles pass by. You see little schools of dolphins once in a while will come and they will swim closer to look at you and then swim away. As this whale is making its journey through the ocean, it's dropping a little bit deeper into the water, so it's a little bit darker, but not too much. It stays fairly close to the surface, probably about the same depth as what the shipwreck was, probably about 100 feet, 120 feet down as it swims along. Uh, below you, once in a while, the seabed rises enough that uh, you can see things pass by. There are coral banks that pass by you as, as your party swims over them. A couple of times you actually see what look like they might have once been chips, bits of something laying on the sandy floor of the seabed. Time just seems to fall away. You've been underwater now and you can't tell for how long. You notice all of a sudden that there's a moment of tenseness and you catch that 
all of your party is paying attention to something they can see much better than you can underwater. And they're paying attention to something that is some type of dark, amorphous mass that is very far off to your forward left. You can't tell what it is, but obviously it's some kind of threat. And it's moving. All that you really can catch with your eyesight through the water at that distance are what look like some big fins flopping through the ocean uh, on the ends of a big mass. They obviously consider it danger because suddenly the captain at the front pulls on the reins a little bit and you feel the whale that you're riding change course as it starts to try and avoid whatever this is, changes course slightly and continues on. You move around this thing who apparently does not notice you or is just not interested enough in you. It recedes into the distance as you continue on for another bit of time. And again, you, you can't tell how long. It could have been 20 minutes, could have been half an hour, could have been an hour. The merfolk have not spoken during this time. They obviously know where they're going. After this period of time traveling, all of a sudden the whale begins to move deeper and deeper. And as the whale moves deeper and deeper, you see the light recede above you as it begins to get darker. But as the light recedes above you, you can see something glowing far, far away on the seabed floor. As you get closer and closer into it, it's obviously a whole latticework of tiny little pinprick lights. And these pinprick lights are an underwater city that is at least one of the homes of the merfolk. The whale comes into the city. There are, there are no walls to the city per se, but there are clearly merfolk warriors guarding the outside of the city as it's down kind of in a crevice between two higher parts the whale just comes to a rest on the seafloor and stops there for a moment. Uh, your party starts to move for a change. Uh, the captain, who is the driving the whale, does not move. But the guards untie you. They pull you in tow as they begin swimming. Uh, when you say untie me, they simply untether me from the reins? Yes. But leave my hands they still bound? They leave your hands tied for now. Okay. Uh, as they untether you for the reins until they bring you down to the seabed floor. And you find yourself standing, looking up at this massive natural structure. You can see it's covered in weeds and stuff. Well, I shouldn't say it's natural. Obviously, it's been made. In this case, I would guess we would call it merfolk made. It's just a huge labyrinth of different buildings and rooms and everything all put together. As the... Uh, as you come to rest on the sea floor, you look back and the captain driving this giant whale has pulled on the reins again and the whale has lifted up and has started back the way you've all come, leaving the four of you there. There's a little bit of idle curiosity from the other merfolk that are around, but none of them come too close knowing that it's not their business. And they're not shocked to see a human man standing there. You are clearly not the first. While you're standing there and they're just kind of idly curious, the mermaid with the red hair herself does come up, pulls out a small dagger from her pouch and does cut your bonds uh, on your wrists because clearly you're not going <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> going. <laughs> they obviously don't consider you a threat and they obviously don't consider that you can escape based mm -hmm. on you where you are. There is some comment and murmuring between uh, the two guards you catch in the background as one of them comments to the other one, it's strange that he's able to always breathe as we do, yet he has no gills. You are led by the three of them down what is a, basically a main central procession area, obviously up to what is some kind of palace. There are elite mer mermen guards standing with bigger tridents. You are led into this inner aquatic hall and up to this much larger figure that is sitting on a great throne. Uh, this is a picture of a man that we would probably think of him like 
a Poseidon kind of figure, some kind of uh, demigod, you notice that he is absolutely three times the size of any of the other merfolk as he sits on on, on this throne uh, with his, his big tail out behind him, holding on to a massive trident. He's got long flowing white hair and a long flowing white beard. As uh, you come up to him, once again, the little mermaid leaves you with your two guards and moves forward to address him. She talks to him in this high, trilling voice, but they're speaking very fast, and you have a very ta- very hard time understanding what they're saying because they're talking so quickly. And you hear his deep, booming, booming voice, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, it sounds much more like a much lower whale sound, while hers is a much higher trill, trill, trill. Uh, one of the things that uh, you hear her say, though, is she refers to him as father. And he, you're very sure that he refers to her as daughter. And uh, she's clearly explaining how she found you, what happened. Uh, he nods in agreement. By this time, the rest of the hall behind you has filled with a lot of merfolk as they've all filtered in. So there's quite a crowd on both sides behind you. There's got to be at least another three to four hundred merfolk there waiting and watching expectantly because they know something's going to happen. As the big figure with the white hair and the white beard sits on his throne, the red-haired mermaid turns and addresses the whole crowd. And she calls out in her high trill and she basically says, I, Kina, daughter of Nereo, one of many, do hereby claim this human by the rights of our people as my mate. Then there's the there's there's cheering and there's clapping, and Nereo beckons you forward. Nereo basically says, "Welcome, human, to our world," and uh, begins to talk to you and examine how you came to be where you are, and why you were there. How did you come to be where you are, (laughs) and why were you there? (laughs) Uh, Myself, speaking probably in Latin. He did address you in Latin. Okay. Uh, Myself and my companions have been on a mission set to us by Arwan, Lord of the Dead and ruler of the Shadow Realm, to build strength and abilities so that we could defeat Santiago and the man known as the Iron Fist and his compatriots. He nods with some understanding. Obviously, he knows who Arwan is. Obviously, he knows who this Santiago is. He may not have heard of the Iron Fist, but he gathers that it must be one of commanders of the soldiering dead. He murmurs in his deep voice back to you that they themselves have had problems with the soldiering dead, and especially with uh, the northern shore of the Gulf. He also talks to you about the fact that they've even encountered now sometimes problems with the ships that pass over, And sometimes they're manned by sailors, sometimes by pirates. But those that they do encounter, they were undead that were manning the ship. They had been corrupted, they'd been attacked, and that this was an unusual thing. Nereo then signals, and there are four mermaids that swim forward, bringing out this massive pearl that they present to you. And they lift the lid. As Nereo says, I present to you your dowry. Uh, This is the dowry that you are being given as the groom to his daughter. So he offers you his, his daughter, and he offers you this dowry. And as you look down into this open pearl, you can see that it is filled with gems. It's, you can even see aerolite clusters, not just aerolite gems, actual clusters that are priceless. There are also, it looks to you like some, a couple of weapons with pearl handles, very long Filet knives with beautiful golden blades and uh, what looks to be a, a coil of rope like you've never seen before in your life. And there are right on top of that, right at the front, there are these two golden, they look like bigger than bracelets, 
golden armbands. There's a smaller one and a bigger one, clearly meant to be wedding armbands. One for you and one for your bride. So, uh, congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> I just... You know, I just, I just want to say, buddy, that I, I'm happy for you <laughs> in your wedded bliss. Uh, I guess now you have to decide what you're going to do uh, uh, about this. Um, I think that it's kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, on one hand, your group needs allies. Yes. Uh, you certainly don't need more enemies. These people, these merfolk, uh, this seems to be a, a strange tradition, but clearly uh, this is what has happened often in the past. Maybe even to your own great, 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 great grandfather. It's at this point that Kena remembers to mention to her father about a couple of the strangenesses that she knows. She interrupts him while he's talking about the dowry and says to him, Father, he is not under my charmed spell. Muriel stops and is surprised by this and looks at her and says, what do you mean he's not under your charmed spell? And she says, he has resisted it. And not only that, we did not cast any type of water breathing on him. He is breathing on his own. And he turns around and he looks at you and he's like, he what? And he reaches out and he grabs you and lifts you up and brings you closer, and there's this giant head that you're looking at right now, and he examines you minutely, turning you from side to side, looking for haps for gills by your ears, sets you back down, and asks you, who are your people? Where do you come from? Because there is something about you that smacks of our own people. Um, indeed, sir. I come from another world. Uh, myself and my companions were brought here for that mission. But my people, my great-great-great-grandfather is said to have married one of the merfolk. Understanding dawns in his eyes where he pulls at his beard and he says, I understand her name was Marina. And he looks at his daughter and he mumbles something. It was not certainly not our people. Perhaps it was one of the Atlanteans. And you gather that they're apparently... There's more than one tribe or nation of these merfolk. Yes. Um, he looks back at you. My family did come from the eastern shore of, of the continent um, by an ocean that we called the Atlantic. He thinks for a moment, he says, and you mean this is in the world of Terra? Not yes, Hollywood. yes, Terra. He says, well, it makes no matter. It'll be something that we can discuss later and perhaps speculate on um, where your heritage comes from. But clearly, you were meant to be with us as you have the same heritage. Even though your, your heritage, your mer heritage is several generations removed, you have retained the genetic abilities to breathe underwater. And though you don't have any look of the merfolk about you, that doesn't matter to our traditions. I must always marry my daughters off and find suitable mates for them amongst the shoremen or the sailors because of the curse that our people bear. We can no longer have male offspring. We can only have female offspring. So this is, he explains to you why they do what they do, and this is their custom. He says, and frankly, you have done quite well, for Kina is one of our most powerful of all of my daughters. So we're going to stop it there so that you can think <laughs> about what you're going to do upon your explanation to him about your party. Mm -hmm. When you said that, he whispers off to... One of the one of his other guards, something, and this guard goes off somewhere you don't know where, and then he continues on as the ceremony has progressed. So that's where you are. That's okay. where we're going to stop uh, this because we're going to play tonight with the whole group. Cool. And um, they're going to find out some things. You're going to find out some things. 
and it's going to be fun. All right. Thanks very much, folks, for catching our little Thank side you. recording. Do you have any questions before or any other things before we shut no, it down? No, I, I need to think about <laughs> how I'm going to respond to this. <laughs> so it's a good time to end for me as well. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What's going to happen? Hmm? Well, congratulations, married man. Good for you. All right. That's enough of that. Off we go. We're going to stop this right here.